it was a different mission in that it was more a multi-service. We were supposed to go in and simply draw a large amount of enemy troops away from a smaller operation in another area. And the CIA had been trying to take take a particular objective for a couple of weeks and they were getting their butts thoroughly kicked. And it was actually a very simple operation. You know, the, the conception of it didn't turn out that way. But. <laughs> General Abrams, who was the commander of all of the military forces in Bennett, he did not like special forces. But when he had a job that he wanted done, SOG was the first unit he went to. They knew that we were capable of doing about any, any job when maybe some of the other units might not do it. Uh, I have my own feelings about Tailwind, but when they selected a company from SOG, they didn't expect to get us out. But I just remember them saying that this was going to be the deepest penetration, something like 100 kilometers behind their lines. We knew right up front the mission was to blow up a bridge. Actually, what we were told is the mission was to cause a diversion, that there was a group of CIA mercenaries that were getting hammered in Laos. And in order to save them, we had been requested to cause a diversion. And that was the mission. During the time when we were surrounded all the time, I think, uh, they weren't a coordinated fighting force where they attacked all at the same time. They would hit us from the back, the sides, the front, and they would be alternating as we were moving, and they were trying to bring more people in to, to surround us. So everybody had been wounded multiple times. Uh, low on ammunition, um, tired, nobody had any sleep. We weren't resting because we were constantly on the alert. We didn't know when we might be attacked to overrun uh, we were out of food, almost out of ammunition. There was no water. We could probably have not gone another day in the condition we were in. We would have probably just elected to find a, as good a defendable position as we could and set up a perimeter and fight it out to the very end. We were at the breaking point where it was total exhaustion. We came across a underground ammo storage depot, an ammo dump. And this thing had telephones in it, phone lines, phones were ringing, and we blew it up. And I remember standing in the, one of the dugout places with Bravel and the phone rang and Bravel made a joke he said you want me to answer it Fifth Special Forces can I help you? Somebody from Van Buskirk's first platoon came back and said Captain you better come up here and see what we've got and I went into uh, this particular hut which was obviously something like the operation shack or headquarters for the camp and it was a footlocker and it was just filled with documents and uh, had money in it. We ended up with I believe it was somewhere around 270 pounds of written documentation. The documents we captured, uh, they're still saying that is the greatest, that was the greatest single intelligence find during the, uh, the entire Vietnam War. Within a week or so, the CIA, they took the objective that they had been trying to take for weeks. We like to feel like we played a part in pulling troops away from them. And it was successful in a lot of other aspects. You fight the enemy for four days and three nights. You have nine major battles with them. You overrun their base camp on the last day, and you don't lose one American, and you lose one indigenous soldier in a crash coming out, and two others during that fight. Unbelievable. We should have lost more men than we lost. We were just lucky. We were smart enough to stay one step ahead of the NVA. Thank God for the Marines and the Air Force. If we really got in trouble, we could call on them and they could get us out. And it was leadership. It was team integrity. It was men that cared for each other and knew that we would only survive if we worked and did exactly as we were trained to do. And that's the essence of Special Forces.
the first time I knew anything about this was one night there was an advertisement about a brand new magazine show called um, CNN Newsstand and I thought well you know I'll turn it on and watch it and I turned it on and um, the announcer said that um, they had a big sensational breaking story and all this that it, and talked about secrets kept for over 30 years and things and then it, I just couldn't believe it. The guy said, this valley of death, Operation Tailwind. Just picture that. Turn on the television, and then they start talking about Operation Tailwind. And it ran through his mind. I, I was on an Operation Tailwind when I was in the Special Forces. And then one of the first photographs in the broadcast is Keith. No one ever talked to Keith. No one inter interviewed Keith. I was just shocked that anybody even remembered it let alone had something on television. The more I watched it, the worse it got. There was nothing in that entire broadcast that was true. 30 years later, your photograph is going to show up on a national news network that labels you as a, as a war criminal, states that you committed war crimes, you killed women and children, you, you murdered your, your fellow soldiers, you wiped out villages. It was hard and it's still hard to really think of what had to be going through his mind. And then, you know, Michael ends up on there and Van Buskirk, and I just, I couldn't believe it. They approached me as for doing an expose on veteran benefits. Not Telwin. Telwin wasn't even mentioned until they got there. And then all of a sudden, it's no longer about my benefits, okay? And I was duped into it because there was a possibility, and it had been mentioned to me on several times. But looking back on it, thinking, I'm going, where and how can I be exposed to anything that has a nerve agent in it? I think April Oliver misconstrued, for whatever reason she wanted to, what I said. And she changed a lot of what I said. She, I would say the things off camera to her. And I think some of the things she edited, she edited intentionally to change what was there. And there was indicator after indicator after indicator after indicator that she was absolutely on the wrong track. And, you know, she found something that buttressed her story. She used it, no matter how stupid it sounded or how uncredible it was. We were accused of killing civilians and possibly killing some of our own people who were, were POWs. That, that concerned me because that, that made us war criminals. My mom had the families and people watching it. I was disgusted. All of a sudden now, instead of helping with my benefits, I'm a goddamn baby killer. I've had people come, I had an old lady come up to me in the Atlanta airport in the service, start beating me with her purse, calling me a baby killer. They, you know, they, they ruin your life and they don't care what they've done to you. And then when you try and take some kind of action against them, they, intentionally victimize you again. There are some allegations, there are some things you can say about people, but the very act of saying them tarnishes someone's reputation for the rest of their life. They have ruined my life to this day. That program aired, now the veteran is saying, we're not gonna give you any benefits, because CNN retracted their story and there was no gas use. I didn't even ask CNN for it, I never submitted CNN program as evidence for my VA benefits. That's pretty harsh because a woman decides she's got an agenda and she's going to put it on tape and call it history. And then she gets people all around her to go along with, this, with the lie. I didn't realize how vicious the people at CNN could be until I myself ended up being involved in this kind of stuff. They have absolutely no respect for anyone. I absolutely believe in a free press. I think a free press is one of the great, great institutions of our society. And if there's anything that's going to tend to keep us free, it is a free press. But along with their power, along with their right, their absolute right to bring us the truth, is the obligation to bring us the truth. I think Tailwind is a good example that could be taught to journalists or the media coming up, that, you know, if you're gonna do a story, don't bypass your experts. I would like to see the, all of us vindicated that it was 
not a true story. I would like to see them admit they intentionally made it up for their own benefits. When you make mistakes, the first thing you do is you acknowledge it, you apologize, and you go forward. They have not acknowledged it, they have not apologized, and screw them on going forward. If all they want to do is make money, we are going to go down and make them famous for making money. You know, we did a hell of a job, and we did it right at that time, and we all came out alive. And that's what they should be telling people. I captured the idea that a documentary was an appropriate way to write this wrong, to tell the story of what really happened, and that's what I started doing. I've told CNN again and again and again, forget about money. It's going to take more than money to settle this case. That kind of wrong calls out for a unique remedy, and the unique remedy is tell the truth about what happened. Tell the truth about who these people really are and what they're really made of, and don't tolerate for another second the American press branding these people as cowards or dope dealers or dope smokers or ne'er-do-wells, all of which is false and has been false for the last 40 years. So I realized that this case was the last battle and that I needed to do something to memorialize that. So what I told my staff to do was to create a banner that says the last battle of the Vietnam War and that I was going to have every soldier, every airman, every Marine, every participant who's involved in this case who's helping to tell the truth sign that banner. And that banner has 75 or 100 signatures on it. Now, interestingly enough, including the lawyer for CNN, they don't understand yet how, because they think they're on the other side, they don't understand how they're going to tell the last battle of the Vietnam War and how they're going to support our side, but they're going to do it because indirectly or directly we are going to get to the truth of what happened in this case, and we're going to show it, and we're going to show it with them kicking and screaming all the way to the bar of justice. Maybe one day I'll get my justice. You know, if, if I don't, if I'm not alive when, when it comes, well, at least my friends will know, you know.